Hey everyone, in today's video I'm going to talk about the top three Canadian dividend stocks to buy in the month of May 2023. All three of these companies, in my opinion, are great businesses, have a really strong track record of providing dividends and capital back to shareholders, and are at fair or undervalued valuation. So we're going to go through what these three companies are, go into their earnings profile, some information, and some overviews of these companies. So really looking forward to this one. Before getting into it, if you can just take a minute to hit the thumbs up button, it really does help with the YouTube algorithm and helps the channel a lot. And also, if you haven't subscribed yet, would love to have you on the channel as well. So be sure to hit that subscribe button. Okay, so the first stock that I'm going to be talking about today is the Bank of Nova Scotia, also known as Scotia Bank. Scotia Bank is a pretty big bank. You can see here it's an $80 billion business, trades at a trailing price to earnings of nine, and is currently paying a 6.1% dividend yield. So has a really strong starting yield on cost for sure, pays it out quarterly. If we look over the last one year, this company's down almost 20%, has really fell with the broader banking sector, especially recently. Um, and they also have some exposure to Latin America, which I think has been a bit of a wobbly business unit for them, which has made them go down this amount as well. Looking a bit longer term, this company is actually down over the last five years, which if we look over the history of the company, it's pretty rare to see a five-year drop. They've been pretty stable um, up into the right slowly over time. Obviously, the, the pandemic hit, they bounced back really strongly, going up over $90 a share, um, and since that has crashed. So it's been a bit more volatility in the last four or five years, and overall, the company's actually down. So this may be, in my opinion, a good buying point to continue averaging into shares for the next time it kind of gets it in, in step um, and, and moves upwards farther. But we're going to look into all of that a bit more I just want to start on their dividend. So you see it's a 6.1% starting dividend. So from day one, you're really getting a pretty good uh, capital return from the company. But what I really want to highlight is this company's dividend growth over time. So even just looking back from 2010, the company paid a buck 96. And I'm not going to read off every year, but you can kind of follow with your eyes. They've increased their dividend every single year since 2010 um, up until now. And they're currently paying... A dividend um, I think this is 2019 so I think it's actually closer to four dollars a share now so from 2010 to now they've essentially doubled <laughs> their dividend so that's a dividend growth rate uh, in the high single digits it may not continue to be that high especially with some of the pressures they're facing right now but to be at a starting yield of 6.1 percent and having a business that's doubled their dividend in the last call it 15 years, if they somehow are able to do that in the next 15 years, then 15 years from now, you're gonna have a yield on cost of essentially 12%, even if you don't reinvest the dividend. So really, in my opinion, low risk from a capital return standpoint, because the starting yield so high that even if the dividend growth slows down a bit, um, you're still going to be in a good spot in terms of how much capital you get back from your investment every year. The other thing here is over the last 45 years, this stock's increased their dividend 43 times. So it's it's not, nothing's for, for certain, um, but it's more than likely you're going to continue to get raises year in, year out um, for the most part over the medium to long term if you hold this stock. Going into this stock um, and this business a bit, I just want to start with their four business lines in the top right hand corner here. You can kind of see the vast majority of their business is in Canadian banking. Um, so lots of that may be mortgages and commercial banking in Canada, um, which historically has been a pretty good business to be a part of. Given the nature of the banking sector in Canada, it's essentially an oligopoly. So not a ton of competition. Um, all of these banks are pretty much too big to fail for the Canadian market. So I think while it hasn't been tested, the downside is pretty limited uh, in terms of like a bankruptcy risk or something like that. 25% of their business is in international banking. We'll go through that in a minute as well, mostly Latin America. 20% uh, global banking and markets, and then 15% is wealth management. And this is an area, the wealth management division, that they've really been trying to beef up over the last couple of years, in addition to international banking. Um, those are kind of the two areas that it seems like they've been trying to grow 
their business disproportionately and to diversify away from just Canadian commercial banking. Let's hear it straight from them. Top reasons to invest in this bank. It's a leading bank across America. So it's a top three bank um, in Canada, Chile, and Peru. Also a top five bank in Mexico and the sixth largest bank in Colombia. So you're getting some diversification by owning this business. You get exposure to Latin American markets, which for lots of Canadian investors um, is not easy to get. Uh, lots of uh, the stocks we can own have lots of U.S. exposure. Some of them have European exposure. But Latin American exposure within a Canadian security isn't too easy to achieve. So it's giving you that opportunity by owning this stock. Um, the other reasons they say here is a diversified a diversified exposure to high quality growth markets. So just unique unique footprint across Pacific, the Pacific Alliance. Um, increased scale and market share in core markets, strong risk culture, solid credit quality, well provisioned, and then acceleration in digital banking. So lots of the digital banking stuff's very um, in line with what you'll see from any big bank in North America. I'd say the truly unique thing about Scotiabank is their Latin America exposure um, and their their ability to drive scale in in, in those um, Pacific Alliance countries. And honestly, their, their price to earnings ratio is, tends to be lower than some of the other ones since they haven't been able to grow as much throughout the pandemic with that exposure um, down in Latin America that I think has hampered their, their growth a bit. Continuing on a bit here, um, some of their geographical mix on international banking, you see here over three quarters of it is Latin America. 22% is Caribbean, and they're getting 1% from Asia. I'm not even sure where that's coming from. Within Latin America, primarily Mexico and Peru, uh, and Chile also. Then Colombia is pretty minor, and then others, maybe just some um, business being done with other countries. Global asset management, they have uh, what appears to be $322 million, uh, billion dollars under management, um, so that's pretty good. You see 90% of it is in Canada. So growing their international assets under management, still an opportunity. They've been looking at acquisitions. I think they've done a couple acquisitions to try to grow this, and that'll probably continue to be a focus area for the business. Continuing to go through this, and, and I don't want to spend, spend too much time with all of these, um, but you can kind of see here some of their market shares across countries. So they, they, they have a real presence in all of these countries. If you go to these countries, walk around, you'll see Scotiabanks, um, just like you do in Canada. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to share was a look at their earnings per share, which I believe is over here in the bottom, bottom corner. You can kind of see, while a bit choppy as of late directionally, they tend to go up into the right annual dividends, very strongly up into the right, 6% Kager there. So mid to high single digit over the last 10 years. Um, so overall, I just think pretty strong business overall. Um, if we look at their earnings estimate, 760 this year, 811 next year, company's trading for 670. So it's trading um, just under nine times current year earnings. And then it's trading at about eight times 2024 earnings. So to have a multiple under 10 times, with a dividend growth rate over the last, you know, 30, 40 years um, at, at a pretty strong clip, continuing to pay a strong dividend of 6.1% as a starting yield and being in a sector that's pretty much an oligopoly um, with limited, you know, long-term downside, I'll call it. Anything can happen with recessions in certain cycles. Uh, I think this company is at a great valuation really poised for strong shareholder returns over the long term and you're not even you're not even counting on the stock to like go up to where it was just um, a couple years ago when it was up at ninety dollars plus you can very realistically make a 10 percent yield on cost on this company uh, in the next five to ten years so this is a business that I think is just at a good point from a risk reward standpoint and I've been adding shares to my portfolio. I'm going to continue adding throughout the month of, of May. The second stock that I'll be buying throughout the month of May is Canadian Apartment Property REIT. So this is a business here 
that has performed really well over the long term as the property market and rental market in Canada, most specifically Ontario, has really boomed. They own primarily residential real estate. Um, they own some uh, MHCs, which is essentially land where people park trailers on and stuff like that. That's only about 5% of their business. But we can kind of see they were up over 60 bucks, uh, dipped into the 40s, still in the high 40s, but their net asset value, which is essentially the asset of their real estate minus the debt that they currently have on their books, um, is significantly higher than the $49. So it's an opportunity to buy real estate in Canada at a discount, believe it or not. Um, it pays a 3% annual dividend yield. They also have increased their dividend nicely over time. And this company makes just over $400 million of funds from operations. For those of you who don't know, that's the best way to read um, profit from real estate companies because on an accounting basis, if there's increases or decreases in asset value, that hits the quarterly profit or loss statements. So funds from operation is essentially like the true profitable cash flow that's being derived from the business. So 400 million, a bit more than that. So they're trading at about 20 times um, trailing earnings, um, which historically is actually um, not a bad value for this company. They've, they've traded 25, 26 times in the past, just given how defensive this business is, how stable <laughs> this business is, and that the population growth is outpacing the build of new residential rental units. So they're pretty um, well positioned from a moat standpoint. Going into their business a bit here, you can kind of see uh, at the uh, end of the last quarter, they had net asset value at about 58 bucks a share. So they're trading at about 20% below what their net asset value is, which is just like a bit of a comfort spot. I've seen REITs trade, you know, 30, 40% below net asset value. So it's definitely not saying that the stock can't go down. Um, but I think over the long term, um, as long as you don't think their <laughs> net asset value is going to crash, which I don't have any signs, see any signs of that happening on res the residential sign, it's it's a good cushion to to buy in under net asset value. So that's a nice 20% cushion. You can kind of see they didn't have very strong growth in 2022. They had strong top line, but the increased interest rates and things like that really diluted all of that value by the time it got to net funds from operation per unit, which was just up. Um, not even a full percentage point. And they actually started buying back some shares at the end of the year. On the year, they added about a million shares, but in the back half of the year, they actually started cutting. So they tend to um, grow their share count every year as they do competitive, like comp and, and also um, buy new companies or, or new real estate assets and stuff like that. Um, but it's been trending down and I feel like based off the last earnings call, it'll continue to trend down as they see their units as a good investment opportunity. Going into just their geography here, you can kind of see, um, one where they're situated. I think they have about 50% of their business, uh, in Ontario, uh, and then the rest scattered across, um, the provinces. And then I believe about 15% is up in the, the, oh, here it is 16% in Netherlands and Europe. So about let's call it 50% Ontario, 35% the remainder of Canada, 16% Netherlands and Europe. Occupancy rates over 98%, which is essentially full, uh, just some you know transitions uh, and stuff like that. What's interesting is if you look at their diversification, 5% is MHCs, um, which is what I was saying before, is essentially land rentals for um, people that have their own houses on top of it. Uh, really stable defensive business uh, over there, but only 5% of the company. 86% of the business is value add. So that's um, real estate that has low in place rents that if they go in on turnovers uh, and replace the kitchen, put in uh, a washer dryer, stuff like that, they can charge significantly more rent at. And then about 10% is newer um, assets that were just created in the last couple of years. On their earnings call, um, they've talked a lot about trying to diversify more towards newer assets. Historically, they've been a value add player and that's how they've maximized growth. But with how expensive constructions got um, and, and doing these conversions and with the limited amount of people that are leaving these 
uh, rental units just because of rent control in some cases and things like that. They really think that pivoting to new construction is the way of growth. So you'll see some dispositions in the value add space and more and more acquisitions in the new construction space uh, throughout the next few years. I think this number uh, was closer to 5 6% 12 months ago. So they're really looking at growing it. It wouldn't surprise me if this gets to um, 20 25% of the portfolio completely at the value adds expense over time. In terms of capital allocation, so they primarily invest in growing their business um, in terms of new construction acquisitions uh, in the new construction space. So they're really looking to grow and drive a lot of scale. They talk about scale a lot in terms of the technology and the best practices they can share across the company. The second thing, and this is new uh, as of late as their stock prices dip so far below net asset value, but their buyback program is the second area they're looking at putting capital. And then the third one is debt repayment. So debt repayment is not a big issue for this company. Um, they have pretty um, conservative uh, debt levels for the size REIT that they are. And while maybe office REITs and some other ones may have challenges re-upping their debt, um, it's no sign of that being an issue in the residential side. So um, good that it's on the page, but yeah, probably not a priority, especially if they can buy back units at a 20, 25% discount to fair value. And that's why they've prioritized it over debt repayment on um, their capital allocation strategy. So I think the... Uh, that may have been the, the last thing I wanted to cover there, but I think that the to, to sum up uh, Canadian apartment REIT, this is just a great diversified play in residential real estate across Canada. You also get this, some Netherlands exposure trading at about 20 times earnings. So this one is not, not necessarily a cheap multiple, um, but very high quality assets. If we looked at their um, funds from operations over the last 10, 10 to 20 years, they haven't really dipped at all. They tend to just go up slowly with time as they increase rents um, slowly but surely uh, and just ride the wave of increased demand and population growth of the Canadian economy. So this is one that I don't know it's, if it's going to double over time, but I think you're going to get that 3% dividend. You're going to get slow dividend increases year over year, probably in line with inflation, and you're going to start getting some capital allocation as they kind of correct closer in net asset value. That's my opinion, at least on this company. That's why I'm adding more of it to my portfolio this month. Going into the third and final dividend stock that I'm buying in my portfolio this month, it is Diversified Royalty Corp. So this is a much smaller company, $400 million business, 8% dividend yield. Just before talking about what this company does, in the last year, they're up 7%. And note, when it's companies that are paying 8% dividend yields, um, you need to factor that into the total return. So 7%, but then it's kind of like 15% because of that dividend. In the last five years, they're down 10%. But once again, 8% dividend times five. Uh, I know it's been a bit choppy, so I'm not sure if it's always been that high, but call it 30 to 40% capital read of, like given back in the last five years of shareholders, 10% stock dip. So about 20 to 30% total shareholder return over the last five years. It's five to 6% net. Not too bad of a investment. So getting into what this company does. This company owns trademarks for brands that then spit them back royalty checks on revenues. Um, so their royalty partners, which is essentially the brands they own, are Mr. Lube, Air Miles, Nurse Next Door, Oxford Learning Center, Mr. Mike's, I think this is a steakhouse that operates in Canada and the U.S., Sudden, which is a real estate company. So it's a every... Every agent that works for this real estate company, it's like a low cost brokerage. So they just pay diversified royalty corp of like 80 bucks a month for their license. Uh, and then they get to keep their full commission. Uh, it's, it's essentially that kind of um, model. And then Stratus was an acquisition that they just made recently that we'll talk about in a minute. But I believe about half of their business is Mr. Lou. So I just want to talk about this one a bit more in depth in terms of the revenue they're getting in. Mr. Lube is Canada's largest lube provider in the routine automotive maintenance sector. In addition to oil changes, they also do maintenance, including fluid changes, filter replacements, windshield chip repairments, tire services, etc. So this is about a 40 to 50 year old company. The acquisition of the trademark was 
almost 10 years ago, and they've actually increased um, the level of the royalty over time as the diversified royalty corp has given them capital to expand um, their business. So just here looking at their um, 2022 year revenues um, for, for the for the year, um, you can see it's about $50 million in revenue, 24 million of that is Mr. Lube. So you can kind of see that's primarily what you're investing in. Some of these other assets are just per, like driving a lot of diversification. So Oxford Learning Center is like, is like tutoring centers and, and stuff like that. Sudden, we just talk, touched on Nurse Next Door is like in-house um, care for, for older um, uh, elderly people in society. Air Miles is a loyalty program. Mr. Mike's is a, is a restaurant chain. So all of those providing, you know, five, six million bucks a year, four to six million bucks a year. And then you have Mr. Lube that is providing uh, the other half of the revenue. Stratus was an acquisition <laughs> that the company actually just made. So it just finished in December. So you're only getting a million bucks of it for 2022. But I believe it's anticipated to be about seven million dollars in annual revenue. So Stratus is soon to be probably the second largest part of their business, still well behind Mr. Lou, but worth talking about as well. As we look at what Stratus is, they are an industry leading franchiser in commercial cleaning and building maintenance. So they have lots of commercial clients like offices and stuff like that. Um, and they sell master franchise agreements to um, business units across North America. So you can kind of see here, master franchisees, 58 across the US, 10 across Canada. Um, and then they have 13 corporate owned um, a, a, as well. So, you know, not, not a huge business, but definitely not a small business by any means. The royalty agreement is interesting. It's actually not a byproduct of, of revenue or not a percentage of revenue, it's a fixed amount. So they agree to pay 6 million US dollars annually. And on that, it's a it's a four to five percent um, automatic growth rate that gets paid every year. So this year will be six million US, next year will be six point three million, the year after that will be six point six million, on and on for the next five years, I believe the agreement is. Um, and then it, it gets adjusted after that. So you're getting a, a, essentially a business that is spinning out royalties, guaranteed royalties, as long as the business is doing fine. Um, that is in total about 10 times uh, multiple of what the capital that Diversified Royalty Corp bought this company for. And Diversified Royalty Corp literally spits out all of their money back to investors for dividends. So when they bought this company, they had to sell shares, um, dilute shareholders in order to execute this. The share price actually went down. Um, but at the end of the day, the company trades at like a 13, 12, 13 times multiple. So getting a new stream of, of revenue that is at a 9.9 .9 times multiple is actually accretive as long as they're able to, to pay it out. There may have been some concern just in terms of operating a commercial business that relied on offices to some extent with you know the narrative about offices dying. Um, but overall, seems like this will be a, a good transaction. You can kind of see here what I was saying earlier. Stratus royalty will grow 5% per year for the next four years. So that'd be 20% growth in four years. This 6 million would be 7.2 and then 4% per year thereafter. So you kind of have a built-in inflationary growth rate built into your return on um, return on investment. Uh, which is nice to see there and can hopefully help drive future dividend growth for this company. So in terms of earnings per share, it's a it's a bit convoluted just because of um, some accounting, but they're saying about 20, 21 cents a share. So the company has currently is currently paying out about 24 cents a share, two cents a month per share um, in uh, dividend and they re reiterated they think they're going to be able to maintain that long term. So let's just call it 24 cents a share. That means that this company is currently trading for 12, 12 and a half times earnings. And, you know, given the diversity of the company, um, 
the diversification of the different sectors. They play in. They have some UX exposure. I love the Mr. Lou business. I think that's really defensive. Some of their other businesses may be a bit less defensive. I think trading at a you know low to mid teens multiple is is a fair multiple for these assets in this business. And I just love how they return all of the money to shareholders every month. It gives me a monthly dividend check that I can go and invest in whatever else I want with. So I think this is fairly valued um, where it is now, but I'm willing to invest a bit more in the company, even at a fair valuation, as long as it's not overvalued, in my opinion, uh, just because it's a relatively small portion of my portfolio. I would love to make it um, a bit of a bigger position, get a bit of a bigger check every month from these businesses. So there you have it. Those are the three top Canadian dividend stocks that I'm buying in the month of May, 2023. If you made it through the entire video, let me know in the comments. would love to hear from you. Also, if you haven't done it yet, would love if you hit the subscribe button. It really means a lot and really helps the channel. And lastly, please subscribe if you haven't yet. We're on our way up closer to a thousand, which is awesome. I want to thank you guys for watching the video and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks.